You're probably more sensitive than most comics, aren't you? Oh, gee, I don't know. I'm, I'm just going through a thing at the moment. I feel very emotionally raw. I mean, I don't know why uh, it's go it's happening. Well, but, I mean, caffeine, I reckon, is the uh, is trick. It? Yeah. yeah. So here we are in the wonderful Temple Bar. Did you look all over Dublin and go, this is where I want to play? Well, I mean, just for, for purely from, I mean, there's a sort of convergence of three thoroughfares there, and it's a good place. It's actually too crowded now for me to play. We are. I mean, I'm going to do a show, but it's, it's now it's too crowded. Oh, come on, let's get it done there. It's I'm looking there. forward to it, baby. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to tell, uh, uh, reenact a, uh, something I actually saw on Temple Bar Square. That's where I do performances there. I don't know if you're aware of that. I, I stand there and I gather crowds and I've learned a very valuable lesson. One of them is that no matter who you are, where you're from, I treat everybody the same. And one time I was doing a show and I had a big crowd of people around me, you know, like this except outside and not in seats. <laughs> and um, so this guy came through in a wheelchair and I thought, oh Jesus, you know, I'm not going to make fun of him and I just ignored him. And the guy stopped there and he looked at me and he said, why aren't you making fun of me? Do you think because I'm in a wheelchair, I don't have a sense of humor? Do you think because I can't walk, I can't laugh at myself? Is that what you think? And of course, the audience around him were like, yeah! And they were, yeah, you know, and I felt really humiliated. And I looked at him and I said, you're pretty funny, but you can never be a stand-up comedian. Now you've got a folk singer there, so you're going to do it here. That's yeah, well, traditionally now it would be very, uh, what's the word, against the sort of busking etiquette for me to set up beside him. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to proffer him with a 10 euro note, sir. I'm going to do this to him, like that. Excellent. How you doing? Hi, my name is David McSavage. Listen, uh, would, I'm just doing a show uh, over there, and I'm sorry to be so pushy and so on, and I totally respect your run. I know you were here first, but I just want to do a show for 20 minutes. If it's possible, could I just leave that there and just sure. take it for... Oh, really? Happy to take your money from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Straight in my pocket. Thank you. Straight, it feels a bit weird. It's straight in. Can I not put it there? Can you like? Yeah. Okay. Can I just take three euro change? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Anthony, <laughs> is it? Much. Thank, you. Thank, you okay, much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. See, that's it, and now there's lots of love, and I can start off the show. Why am I looking into the camera? You're already all of a 10 down, though. What? You're already 10 euro down. Yeah. Do you understand economics? Thanks, good night. <laughs> Hello, how are you?
guys, how's it going? Big sea of happy people here. Yes, actually, speaking of happiness, you know, you know happy ad <clears throat> on the radio, 11, 8, 11. 11, 8, 11, 11, 8, 11. It's a real happy ad, isn't it? 11, 8, 11. Now a golden page is talking. 11, and then you ring and he goes, hello, directory inquiries. <laughs> Mary speaking. <laughs> Husband bastard left me and the kids in Barnes and Austria. How may I help you? Can the phone number please for the GPO? How do you spell that? <laughs> An aircom. Have you ever tried to synchronize your voice with the aircom messaging service? Ring your phone. I rang mine and I get this. Hello, welcome to the aircom messaging service. Brennan Burke! Cannot come to the phone right now. <laughs> and, and you're speaking of accents, you're receptionists. Why do receptionists talk with that most irritating accent? You know, well, David O'Connor, please come to receptionist. David O'Connor, to reception. <laughs> Well, Michael O'Brien, it's Michael O'Brien, please come to reception. You don't talk like that outside of work, do you? I went to the pub, I 15 pints of Guinness, that's 15 pints of Guinness, woke up this morning with my willy hanging out. It's like getting out of a little old broken mini and getting into a huge big 7 series BMW, like going from Gibneys to, to here, you know, but uh, absolutely enjoy it. I'm, I'm knackered, I'm wrecked. You know, I feel like I'm not been doing a football match or something like that, you know. Kicking balls all night. I'm actually I'm wearing a new bra on stage tonight. Uh, it's got the new NASA anti-gravitational bust technology. It's uh, it's called a shock and awe. It gives you an awe-inspiring cleavage when you put it on, and it's quite a shock for anybody in the immediate vicinity when you take it off again. <laughs> There's loads of young b bitches, sorry, women in the audience tonight. <laughs> And they're looking at me, and they, these teenagers say, Jesus Christ, what age are you? You look about 10, you haven't got a clue what I'm on about. That's because, ladies, when you're in your 20s, you kind of automatically associate your breasts with the upper part of your body. <laughs> and then... <laughs> you hit your 30s, and it's suddenly like, they don't want to hang out with your shoulders anymore. They're strangely attracted to your stomach. And your stomach's going, come, we will make for you a shelf of fat and flesh. Come. Rest yourself, thither. You're clapping because you're going, it's true, it's true, except she's got a higher shelf. But uh, she, No, I heard an old woman talking about this on the radio the other day. Uh, Jerry Ryan, I think it was. <laughs> He was just saying, you know, he talks about a lot of personal stuff. He was just saying how he felt his own bust had begun to sag a bit. <laughs> and this woman phoned in and she said, well, Jerry, if you want to know whether or not your bust is actually sagging, what you do is you pop your top off, you stand in front of the mirror, you take a pencil or a biro, you put it under the breast, you take your hands away and if it stays there, they're drooping. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm going to try that. So, Michael, what I did was I popped my top off. I'm standing in front of the mirror. Oh. The sow man's behind me, shoving it. No, sorry. And, <laughs> Hi, Dad. And uh, <laughs> standing there, I, I couldn't find a pencil or a biro. I could only find my laptop. But... <laughs> I'm such a good girl. And my only obsession is, did, did I do too long? I was kind of flipping through my set going, oh, if I don't have enough time, I wish I could do my other stuff at the end and then I kind of yeah it was, it was I, I had to leave out some nice material just because your head is shiny doesn't mean your sex appeal is tiny you have the right to bear arms that's why you have no sleeves on your jacket that's why you have no sleeves on your jacket <laughs> The first time I busked was when I was 17. And, uh, Here though? Yeah, in, in Grafton Street. So yeah, I just started off there. And so what I, always, I always wanted to be in a, in, a, in a band or some kind. I always wanted to be a performer. I always wanted to be stand up. I mean, I so admired, you know, performers. Oh my God, ladies and gentlemen, white socks and black shoes. White socks and black shoes. White socks and black, next. 
it was actually weird to be looking out at the audience and you could start to recognise the people I knew. I go, oh, there's my sister up there. Why isn't she laughing? She's heard it before. But um, it was good fun. I really enjoyed it. It's, it's, it's very nice to see so many lovely ladies here this evening. Because uh, I have to say, I'm a big fan. How are we doing? How are we doing? Now you can stop. I know it's fake. Relax. I've been single now for about three or four stone, I suppose, at this stage. And, um... <coughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. How are you? How's well it When you've been single for a while, you get a bit desperate, you know. And um, I got so desperate, I ended up going to a dating agency. And I was going out on all these dates, and not much was working out. So I went back to the woman who was running the dating agency and said, look, if you've not got someone on your books, right, who doesn't care about how I look, doesn't care what job I have, someone who has a nice big pair of tits. <laughs> and she checked on the computer and said, actually, Carl, we do have one, but um, unfortunately, it's you. As a young Limerick lad, what made you get into comedy? Billy Connolly played Limerick, and I saw him and thought, oh, I want to do that. And my girlfriend at the time, I said, oh, I want to be like that. And she looked at me with total disgust. Well, she said it as well. No, I said, I wanted, I wanted, no, I wanted to be stand-up comic. Right. And she thought it was like, no, you'll never be that. And, I'll take and then I saw you and thought, no, I can. Yes, <laughs> anyone can do it. So I've been making the effort now, you know, trying to better myself, you know, and going on diets and stuff, but... Me going on a diet is a bit like England entering a football tournament, you know. It starts with all this optimism, you know. <laughs> Early good results are exaggerated. <laughs> and it ends with someone innocent being blamed for it all going wrong. And occasionally violence in a kebab shop. Thank you, yeah. But you have all these diets now, these fancy diets that people do, like the big one at the moment is the Atkins diet. On the Atkins diet, you can eat as much meat and protein as you like, as long as you don't eat any carbohydrates and you're supposed to lose weight. And then you've got things like the Evans diet, when you can eat as much carbohydrates as you like, as long as you don't eat any meat or protein and you're supposed to lose weight. Well, they're both shit, right? <laughs> I've been doing the two of them now for the last while. <laughs> And with the writing process with you, because it's very much like well-crafted gags as such, yeah. but um, so do you write every day or just let things occur very to you? Very I, let, I, I let it occur pretty much and I try and make note of it and I, I host a gig in Limerick a lot, which I'll try out new stuff there and if it really works, it's in the set. <laughs> to be honest, I'm putting on weight, you know? <laughs> Yeah, you love it. Um, <laughs> but I've been making the effort, you know, I joined the gym and I, I didn't know what to expect in the gym. You know, I'd never trained in the gym before, used to play lots of football, was quite fit, but never trained in the gym. So I went into the gym and the fitness instructor is there, right, um, for your induction, uh, which program would you like to be on? I don't know, I don't, what, what programs do you do? He says, well, we do two main programs. Um, do you want to put on weight or do you want to lose weight? <laughs> Which would you recommend? <laughs> so he said to me, do you recognize any of the equipment we have here in the gym? And I said, I do indeed. Um, the televisions. Um, <laughs> the phone. And the sofa. I know how to use the three of them together as well, if it's any help. <laughs> so are you still living with your parents or have you got your own place? I live, I live with my father and my sister right. at home, yeah. And what age are you? <laughs> well, I've only recently moved back. No, no, we'll edit that bit out. What age are you, Carl? <laughs> Who lives with his dad? Um, I'm 33 next month. Well, by the time this is broadcast, I'm 33. I lied on stage about my age, I'm sorry. You said you were 30? Yeah, yeah. Why? it just fits the material and shows how old it is. <laughs> Well, anyway, nice to meet you and good luck nice with everything. Thanks very much. And safe home. <laughs>
that whole Celtic Tiger economy we had going there for a while, it wasn't going to last anyway. Because basically, it was a false economy. The whole thing was a false economy. The economy was created by governments around the world to alleviate a particular problem that was happening around the world. Because what happened was, some of you might be too young to remember this, but in the 80s, in Ireland, tens of thousands of unemployed men and women, and it's just men I'm actually thinking of for this particular story, right? because what happened was, tens and thousands of unemployed men, right? And these men were getting on boats and planes, and they were heading off to Boston and New York and Australia and you know, all of London, everywhere. They were heading out off around the world, right? They'd be meeting these women, they'd be sleeping with them, having sex with them, thus spreading the dreaded Irish ugly gene, right? That's what happened in the 80s. Because, you know, these women, they, you know, they're innocent enough, they, you know how it is, they'd be in nightclubs, having a few drinks, you know, a bit drunk, it would be dark, you know. They'd meet this man and they'd go home with him, they'd sleep with him. It was only, you know, when they wake up in the morning, they turn around and go, oh God, they see this kind of pale, translucent, Celtic monstrosity lying beside him. Oh no, I've slept with an Irish man. <laughs> And that panic thing, and then, you know, the girl, of course, would, you know, you know, do her best to get rid of them, you know, tell them there was a shop around the corner selling Tato crisps or something, you know. And, you know of course, Paddy be on with the O'Neill shorts and out the door, you know. <laughs> Great. But then, you know, a few weeks later, the poor girl would, you know, find out she was pregnant. And uh, nine months later, through no fault of her own, she'd give birth to a very, very ugly child. <laughs> so this was, this was a problem. So... The governments of the world got together and they basically came up with this idea where they said, let's keep Irish men at bloody home where they belong. Don't be letting them roaming around the world with their manky chromosomes, right? So basically, they created this Celtic tiger economy. You know, the Americans were, you know, were great. They did their part. They, you know, pretended they needed all these millions of computers that they no use for in the first place, you know, which is great. EU poured millions into roads and infrastructure. It was great. And for a while it worked. But as I say, it's kind of gone now. It was never going to last because it was a false economy. And in a few months' time, we're going to have Irish men heading off again around the globe with their manky chromosomes. And it's just to ensure that for a few more generations at least, we're going to have Americans or whatever, you know, coming back here, looking for their ancestors, looking for their relatives, just so they can go up to them and say, Look what you fucking do to me, my God, <laughs> Who better to talk about ugly Irish people than somebody who's been encountering ugly Irish, ugly Irish men? I must, I, I must point out I was talking about ugly Irish men. Uh, not because I don't think Irish women are ugly, uh, I'm just too sensible to even go there. Temple Bar. You don't have to walk very far to find a bar. There's even a bar in Temple Bar called the Temple Bar. Lots of English guys walk around. What the fuck are you looking at? You aren't fucking around fucking aliens, but you know. Hello, girls. I would love to. You. Did you go to university, right? No, I didn't. I failed my leaving cert. I got eight points. Eight points, which is pathetic. You know, past a few. And so what? Because so so like your dad and obviously and then would have been mean, very ambitious for you to go to the he, My, my father there. wanted me to be kind of like a Richard Harris figure, a man just about town. Pissed. And, you know, so just... So he gave you a bottle of whiskey? Yeah, like, like a guy like yourself, <laughs> so, You know, rugby playing, you know, an academic and so on. And I turned out to be this sort of tender freak. Beige is my favorite color. I'm at a certain age where I can't get enough beige in my life. I want to be a beige colored wife. My God, look at those pants. Hello, I bought these pants in Germany. The man who sold them to me told me that they are very special pants. And they were. Most people, they're walking around town and they're kind of a bit bored. And, they, and if they see some guy just taking, making fun of completely innocent passers by, it's intrinsically, outrageously funny, and people are just shitting themselves, laughing so much. So, and it's and and their laughter, it's just a, it's a, you know. Hello, hello, lovely, oh, lovely, hello, hello. It's the Mad Slapper 100 meter race. As Irish people, we are very insecure and we have a low self-esteem, and English people have intrinsically feel superior to everybody in the world. And it's all to do with the English people's colonial past. You know that kind of English people. We used to own here, 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 and here. And here, and here, and here. And all of here, and here, and here. 
and here, and here, and here. And now we earn here. But the real reason we are the way we are is more to do with the size and shape of our countries. Because if you look at Ireland on a map, it's a tiny little squashed teddy bear shape in a sit up and beg position, alone, adrift in the Atlantic, with a little woolly arse. That's Wexford. And England is like a big dirty pervert looming over, stalking us. And we're like this, would you feck off England, would you? And England's like, who's your daddy all and I? Who's your daddy? <laughs> you know you want it. I diddly diddly don't want it. And you prefer indoors or outdoors now? I prefer... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, indoors, it's, a, it's a, you know, a lot of waiting around and, you know, you're relying on this and relying on that. Whereas here, there's an audience ready-made for you. And all the profits from my show go to my son here, who needs operations on his leg. <laughs> Can hardly... He's delivering the biggest postcard in the world, ladies and gentlemen. I met a beautiful woman last night She had a beautiful face and a beautiful body But she had the brain of a pigeon A pigeon A pigeon I was drunk, I didn't care I went home with her anyway the next morning I woke up, I looked into her eyes. She looked at me and she said, Oh, oh, oh. I made love to a pigeon last night. I was drunk, it was out of sight. With the skinny little legs and a penetrating eyes, a lice infected neck and the feathers. I stayed with her for a week. She gave good beak. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyway, listen, ladies and gentlemen, you've been a fantastic audience. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you very much. Well, I actually find you quite fascinating to refer.